I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us. And we have big, big news tonight in one of the big trials that we are tracking here on Court TV. It's the case of 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse. He's the guy from Illinois who went to Wisconsin, to Kenosha, got himself an AR-15, was in the middle of all those riots and ended up shooting and killing two people. He claims self-defense. Well, today was the preliminary hearing. And let me tell you, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, they don't get along. This thing was kind of dicey. Let's take a look. There's no dispute in this case that Kyle Rittenhouse armed himself with an AR-15 on August 25th, 2020, at the age of 17 years old. That's it. It's that simple. There is no allegation anywhere that my client was hunting on August 25th, 2020. And in the video, it starts with Mr. Zeminski saying to Rosenbaum, get him or kill him, correct? Excuse me. I have not heard that line, uh, and I definitely could not say with certainty that I heard uh, Mr. Zeminski saying that. Your Honor, I believe the evidence in this case, uh, preliminary hearing has established probable cause that the defendant committed a felony on August 25th, 2020. The evidence indicates that the defendant shot and killed two individuals and shot and wounded an another. Your Honor, we would object to bind over maintaining all objections to the pretrial rulings and the bind over. Um, the government can go off on their chaotic um, quest, but the evidence is clear. Thank you. Uh, therefore, based upon the testimony presented today uh, by the detective, um, I do find the state has demonstrated probable cause uh, that in this case, uh, felonies were committed uh, relating to the counts in the complaint. Um, I bind over uh, as such uh, that probable cause further exists that this defendant committed those felonies. All right, let's break it all down. Big news today, so let's bring in the best team of legal journalists in the business with me tonight. Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, Court TV anchors Julie Grant and Michael Ayala, and Court TV special contributor Ashley Banfield. Welcome to you all. Uh, Julie Janae, I'll start with you. Why don't you give us the big picture of what happened today in this Zoom hearing? Vinny, big picture is you saw no reaction from Kyle Rittenhouse hearing that his case is going to be bound over for trial. A lot of that reaction coming from his attorney. The big takeaways today, other than that, first of all, this was his first time being in front of the court as a free person. Uh, we saw him today walking into his attorney's office, Mark Richards. That's where he was for this Zoom remote hearing in front of the court commissioner. He was there and interacting with his attorney a lot. You saw a lot from him sitting there uh, in the time before he actually was in front of the judge, in front of the trial commissioner, rather. And there was also a pending motion on the table to dismiss from his attorneys, uh, arguing that two of the charges, the weapons charges, should be dismissed for a lack of probable cause and the fact that they claimed that the statute did not read in a way that was keeping with the way the state was looking at it. So let's take a look at what those uh, the, those actual motions were. Those both were denied. Those weapon possession charge, we see now the court finds probable cause does exist, but also that those motion, that motion to dismiss the weapon possession charges was also denied today. There's still some pending motions that the court is going to take up. But today in this Zoom hearing, we only heard from one witness from the state. That was a detective who talked very briefly about exactly what uh, the complaint in this case shows that the evidence points to him firing that weapon at the three individuals. One of those individuals was in court today. The uh, third person that was allegedly shot and injured by Kyle Rittenhouse, and that was Gage Grossroyce. He was there with his attorney. Uh, she was there representing him. We also saw the investigator for the defense, Steve Spignola, someone who was going to testify but did not, and also the father of one of the victims, John Huber. They're representing his son. He's there with counsel, and you could see how distraught he was during this hearing, not only hearing the details, but also hearing how his uh, the alleged victims in this case were described by the defense. Yeah, there was a moment, Julie, today, and I want to I play it for everyone right now because I, I thought it was, uh, you know, it was, 
It's heartbreaking. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, this is a father who's going to be there for everything as it happens. But um, let's take a listen as he reacts to what the defense attorney is saying. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 3. That's a picture of Mr. Rosenbaum after he's been shot and he's wearing a mask, correct? Correct. It's a crime in Wisconsin to commit a crime while masked, correct? Uh, in relevance. <laughs> Wait, I hear somebody in the background. Please uh, refrain from saying something. If there's somebody commenting in the background or making noises, please. Thank you. So, Julia, they were talking about one of the victims, but that's not his son, right? Right, that's not his son. That is the other victim. That was the first shooting victim, or second shooting victim, rather. Uh, Anthony Huber is his son, but this is Joseph Rosenbaum that is being shown there without a shirt, with a shirt wrapped around his face. And the defense uh, made several claims, calling that this victim is a mass robber, trying to get that evidence out in front of the trial commissioner the state making their objection to those characterizations, saying that goes to the argument of self-defense and saying that that is something that should be left up to a jury at trial. Yeah, that, to me, that was a real takeaway from today, is that uh, prosecutors really narrow what they were putting in front of this judge slash commissioner today and didn't want to stray from there. They don't have to for, for, for a preliminary hearing like this, but the defense trying to get as much as possible. So I want to go through some of the evidence that the defense was putting forth uh, with uh, our, our, um, our team here. Ashley, I want you to take a listen to um, this testimony. And this is regarding one of the images that is taken from the videos and the photography that was taken that night of an unidentified person who's kicking Kyle. And you've also got one of the victims, Anthony Huber, there with his skateboard. Let's take a listen. You've seen this photograph? Correct. And that is who I will, an unidentified individual who I will refer as to jump kick man, kicking my client, correct? Correct. You can see my client being knocked backwards in this photograph, correct? Correct. So contact was made, correct? Yes, sir. And as Kyle is being knocked backwards, you see an individual with a skateboard approaching my client, correct? Yes, sir. And based upon the clothing and the straps, who is that? That's Anthony Huber, sir. Okay. And he has just retrieved his skateboard from swinging at it, trying to hit Kyle earlier, correct? Correct. All right, Ashley, we, we see where the defense is going. I mean, none of this was necessarily relevant, according to the judge, to today's hearing, but it's relevant to the case. Yeah, and I think, hey, these are the cases that are uh, are being litigated in the media. I mean, there's a lot of public interest in this case. And so I'm pretty certain that the defense attorney knew that there'd be coverage and that these pictures would get out and maybe help in the narrative that he's trying to, to shape. Um, th there's, a, there's an expression that keeps getting used um, a lot, and that is that you don't get to appoint yourself sheriff, shoot the place up, and then claim self-defense. Because what you're looking at right now in these pictures happened after Mr. Rosenbaum was killed in another parking lot. So <clears throat> already, Kyle Rittenhouse has uh, allegedly um, shot Mr. Rosenbaum dead. This crowd is coming in for him. I think the other issue that you see here is you can see the skateboard circled and you can certainly see the dropkick guy who, by the way, has not been identified. We don't know who he is. We don't even know if police know who he is. At this point, we don't know if he's ever been identified. And you can see uh, Kyle Rittenhouse being, being kicked. There's another expression that is, uh, I'm going to just slightly tweak it. You don't bring a gun to a skateboard fight. And when I say that, I don't mean that to be humorous. I mean it to be the, the argument that will be raised, and that is that you, you can't use that kind of force. It's not commensurate. A gun against a guy with a skateboard uh, or a guy who's, who's you know, do, doing a jump kick, you could easily see a, a jury being swayed that that is not um, commensurate force or appropriate force to be met if you're in fear for your life. But I do think that, the, the, you know, preliminary hearing is not where this is going to get litigated. It is going to get litigated in the press, and it will be litigated in the courtroom. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, let's take a look at another photo. Um, 
involving that skateboard, and this is the point where uh, Kyle Rittenhouse gets hit in the head. You testified on direct examination that Mr. Huber tries to hit my client in the shoulder neck area, correct? Correct. He hits him in the back of the head. Is that a fair statement based upon Exhibit 8? The, the picture is a freeze frame. It's hard to see the actual motion of it. I mean, contact's definitely near the back of the head, but I couldn't say there's direct contact. On the early morning hours of August 26th, you took a photograph of a large bump on the back of my client's head where he had turned himself in at the Antioch Police Department, correct? I did not take that photograph. My partner did. Okay. You've seen that photograph, correct? Correct. And that photograph was on my client's head, not his shoulder or neck. Fair statement? Correct. All right, Michael, how do you see the, the skateboard uh, issue when, when it comes to self-defense? Well, I thought the defense did a fantastic job there. As we talked about yesterday, part of what they're trying to do is they're trying to get various things on the record that they could perhaps use at trial. So what he did there, he got on the record that, in fact, the skateboard was used as a weapon against Kyle Rittenhouse, that it actually did hit him, and that possibly caused injuries that they do have pictures of. All that is now on the record. He'll be using that at trial. Trust me. But we've said all along, Vinny, that that second confrontation really depicts perhaps a lot of attackers. There might be a sense of self-defense there, but what Ashley said is very right. This is a continuum of a night that started with another shooting much earlier. So the entire thing has to be taken in context, and we really don't have all that information. Let's take a look now. There's a, a, a one of the victims who survived, who, who got shot, and he was uh, in the hearing, as Julia told us. Uh, here is a picture of him with a handgun. This is one of the victims has a handgun. Let's take a listen. Showing you what's been marked is Exhibit 10. This is Mr. Huber holding his chest, dropping his skateboard on the ground in the floor of the image, correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Grossowitz is surrendering to my client, putting his hands up, correct? His hands are up, correct. Okay. And in his right hand, you can see the butt of a nine millimeter handgun, correct? I couldn't tell you caliber, sir, but there's a firearm in his hand. All right, Julie, and there's, there's more testimony today related to that gun that he came back going towards Kyle Rittenhouse with the gun. And there's another freeze frame where he's pointing the gun at Kyle Rittenhouse. What does a jury do with that? Does that sound like self-defense here? That's a tricky one, Vinny. And in some ways, and I know you know this from having been a prosecutor, in some ways, attempted homicide cases can be tougher to prove than homicide cases. Why? Well, think about the obvious reason, because the intended victim is still alive, didn't die. So sometimes it can be trickier, and oftentimes, especially when that person who's the alleged victim gives testimony, gets even trickier. So here the bottom line is going to be who was the aggressor, and at the end of the day, was that shot justified in, in, in self-defense? We know that this is going to wind up being a self-defense case with all of, of the, you know, the homicide charges and, of course, the attempted homicide charge here. And in this one, we have two men, both of them with deadly weapons, both of them armed and a lot of action. That was a very, very chaotic scene. And Michael made a great point in saying that we really don't have all of the context. It's easy to look at one freeze frame like we have here and try to visualize the whole story. But one picture really doesn't tell the whole story. The testimony, all of the evidence correlated is going to tell everything. So it becomes tricky at the end of the day in order to have self-defense, in order to have a justifiable shooting, a justifiable homicide, you're going to have to have the, the, the shooter, the defendant, in fear of death or serious bodily injury, and that fear has to be imminent. And just from these pictures, we can see these guys are in very, very close proximity to one another, and we've got deadly force on both sides here in these pictures, Vinny. So that charge is going to be a tough one. Defense tried very hard today to get it dismissed, but that doesn't mean it's going to stick in the end just because it's stuck today. Today, this was a very, very low burden that the prosecution made it over. Yeah, it seemed like the defense was trying to prove a stand-your-ground case in a, in a state that doesn't mm -hmm. have stand-your-ground. Julie Janae, what's right. next? 
Now that the case has been bound over, it's going to get transferred to a, an actual judge there in Kenosha County Circuit Court. Bruce Schrader is going to be presiding over this case. And they also, at the end of the hearing today, talked about when they want to schedule arraignment. They weren't actually able to come down on a specific date, but they said it's going to be the first week of January. Well, he'll be able to uh, plead guilty or not guilty. And at this point, no trial date set because we are still very, very early in this case in terms of litigation. All right, Julie Janae, thank you so much.